שנייה. כן, אוקיי, בסדר, אנחנו יכולים להתחיל. אוקיי, אוקיי, אז שלום אברי-בדי, אני יוזד להתמיד יאל בניצנים, אני מכיר את כמה מהפעמים שאני מיסד, Yes, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm happy uh, to give now the class. So uh, let's start. So as you all know, today is the 2nd of July. Uh, it was said uh, when there were coalition uh, treatments, uh, the the Heskem Coalizioni, it was said that the, uh, uh, all the issue of the Ribonut, the annexation, Uh, of uh, parts of Judea and Samaria, that will be not earlier than the 1st of July. And all the journalists and everyone were waiting to see what will happen in the 1st of July. So all of us know that uh, currently uh, there wasn't anything, but you know, uh, from the surroundings of Netanyahu, it is said Hello. that there will be something. Yeah. And, um, Okay, so uh, here... I have an idea which speech, so I'm waiting for him to get up. He's just getting up now. One second. Uh, excuse me all. Yeah. So I uh, just want to apologize. I did something very not democratic now. I muted all uh, so that we won't have disturbances. So I muted all, but I want to clarify. Each and every single one of you is able to unmute himself or herself and ask a question or make a comment. So please do so, okay? Uh, currently, you're all muted. That's just for the convenience that, uh, that there won't be background disturbances, but it's very easily, uh, anyone who wants to make a comment or ask a question, just unmute yourself and speak up. So now I'm, I'm going back to the background of, the, of our, our shear. Uh, now it's the 2nd of July, and uh, there were a lot of discussions about uh, annexing, uh, announcing sovereignty, announcing, declaring sovereignty on uh, Israeli sovereignty on parts of Judea and Samaria. Okay. So now the, the question is, the question is, of course, um, Uh, what is a, the uh, Jewish perspective on this? And I want to clarify my question. Politically, I'm not going to tell you my political opinions, even though I have political opinions regarding the matter. But, you know, uh, I'm a rabbi here, and, you know, different people have different uh, opinions regarding the matter in terms of practicality, what's pragmatically is right to do. Um, some right-wingers think it's a good thing to announce uh, sovereignty on parts of Judea and Samaria. Some right-wingers think it's wrong from all kinds of directions. I'm not only talking about Moetzet Yesha. Some left-wingers, surprisingly, uh, I heard there's a left-winger that was for it. Uh, there were many left-wingers that are against it. So there are all kinds of cheshboinus. Uh, is it, is it, it, will it what's wrong with the current situation that we're building there without, and now it will just create tension, or on the other hand, there's a lot of significance, all kinds of political opinions and realistic assessments about uh, uh, potential outcomes of the, and all of this is extremely interesting, but that's not what I'm gonna talk today about, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about a preliminary question. Meaning, what is the, uh, 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 from a Torah perspective, from a Torah perspective, is there any value, is there any religious Jewish value in Jewish sovereignty over lands of Israel? Some of you might tell me automatically yes, but then I'll ask you, where in the Torah does it say that it's important that we'll have, that there will be Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. Now, by the way, I'm not, now I'm not talking about Judea and Samaria. I, 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 I went, I, I, I went backward. I, I went back and I said, you know what? Forget about Judea and Samaria. Is there any value in, you'll call it Malchus Israel? Is there any 
value in Jewish sovereignty over the land of Israel. And if there is any value, just tell me where do you see it? Um, anyone has an idea? Where can I see uh, any, uh, any source or any uh, discussion or any uh, um, um, attitude or someone that comments about, you know, the significance, if there is at all, of Jewish sovereignty over the land of Israel? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Brit ben Abtarim. What? Brit ben Abtarim. Where, where in Brit ben Abtarim do you see um, Hashem promises, let's say in Brit ben Abtarim, he promises Abraham that after they will be in Egypt, he will take them out Berchush Gadol. Um, okay, I'll, 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 I'll comment from what Marsh is saying in a second, she'll, what she wrote in the, in, the, in the chat, but just telling us that we're going to go to the land of Israel, you know what, maybe I should have clarified the question more. Let's say there is a, a Turkish regime or a British regime, I'm speaking totally ther theoretical, it never happened here in Israel, uh, a British regime, a British uh, uh, um, government over the land of Israel. And let's say that this British government gives me total religious freedom. It is known that many Jews are making Aliyah, many Jews are living in Israel, only the state is run and the government is foreign. Maybe the UN, the UN is running the country, not a good idea. But let's say, uh, uh, let's say there is a British mandate, okay? I'm, I'm speaking, let's say there is a British mandate and it gives full religious freedom to the Jews. They allow us, they allow us to build the temple. We're building the temple on the Temple Mount. But the government, the prime minister, it, it's, it's just a British uh, colony, okay? Is there any problem with that from a Jewish perspective? So Marsha wrote in the chat, Marsha wrote, King Temple, meaning that she's, the, the, the fact that there is a, a, a paragraph in, in, in Deuteronomy, in Parsha Choftim, in Sefer Dvarim, about, about, a, a, about a, a appointing a king, that shows that there, there is a Jew, that there is a value in Jewish sovereignty. Okay, we'll discuss that. Uh, Brit ben Abtarim was mentioned, but Brit ben Abtarim only says that we're going to go as people to Israel. Who it doesn't say who is running the country. You just dwell in the country. And that goes with what Marsha says, it's pikuach nefesh, to be in the exile. Okay, let's say I agree. So here the nations allow you to be in Israel, uh, have expressed religious freedom. You're no more in the exile. Only the, the, the sovereignty is not a Jewish sovereignty. Doesn't matter at all. Now, people sometimes say, mitzvah yishuv eretz Yisrael. There is a mitzvah to dwell in the land of Israel. Okay? Mitzvah yishuv eretz Yisrael. I'm speaking here with 29 people, 28 people, because also the Bat Sherud is one of the members here. I see there are 30 participants. I was born in Israel, my parents were born in Israel. I don't know about the Bat Sherut that is here, but at least 28 people here, I believe, are people that made Aliyah, and I admire them. Now, I admire all of you. I didn't make Aliyah. I just didn't have the opportunity because my parents were born here, uh, and I was born here. But Tachlis, I, I, I'm, I'm admiring you. For me, it was easy. I was born here. And People who did Aliyah, so okay, they came to Eretz Yisrael, and now they dwell in Eretz Yisrael. They're making, they're, they're doing, performing mitzvah yishuv Eretz Yisrael, but that still doesn't prove the fact that there is a mitzvah to dwell in the land of Israel, and that a place of a Jew was to live in the Holy Land. That doesn't say anything about the sovereignty. Not necessarily, at least. Okay? And indeed, you see that in, in uh, radical Haredi 
circles. Uh, they're saying um, definitely a sovereignty of a secular Jewish state. It's just like having a Turkish regime, regime or, a, or, or a British regime. It has no more, no more significance than that. And uh, okay, maybe an ideal regime, they do admire like a, a religious uh, uh, government, Jewish religious government, but some of them might even tell you, no, the whole point is Yishuv Eretz Israel to dwell on the land of Israel. The sovereignty, who cares? Where is it written that it's important? Marsha mentioned the king. Well, you know, the paragraph of the king is a little controversial. It's true that the Rambam understood there is a mitzvah to appoint the king. Uh, but uh, who said uh, that uh, everyone agrees with him? Okay, the commandment to conquer Israel. Okay, well, we'll, we'll mention that, and we'll see whether that implies a value of Jewish sovereignty. And at any rate, so A, not everyone agrees that there is a commandment to, to, to appoint a king, and B, even ones who agree. So they're talking again about an ideal, Lechora, about an ideal Jewish regime. What does it have to do with the current state of Israel? Now, if the current state of Israel doesn't fall under that basket uh, because it's a secular regime and it's not a king or uh, this or that and or that, then since there's no value in Jewish sovereignty, I, I mean religious value, there might be a strategic value, but no religious value in Jewish sovereignty, even on Tel Aviv, then uh, on the same token, there is no a value in Jewish uh, sovereignty, announcing Jewish sovereignty, no Jewish value in, in, in Judea and Samaria. That's what my claim, that, that might be a claim. And la I, I, of course, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make laws in land to protect the Jews in it. Okay, so I have a great Hasidah Yumot Olam, the British mandate, they're great people and they'll do every law to, they, they're committed to protect the Jews. At any rate, at any rate, when, uh, if I'm, um, um, uh, as Rabbi Wine, Rabbi Bro Wine pointed out, and I was mechavin to his uh, opinion, I'll show it soon, soon uh, later, later in this year, maybe if there'll be time, uh, uh, his, his uh, comment on this, that there is an interesting coalition between extreme Haredi circles and the extreme left-wing uh, liberal circles, um, secular ones. Uh, some of you might have heard of the Jewish of the Jewish uh, philosopher thinker called uh, uh, George Steiner. George Steiner, and you know what? He didn't invent it. Let's think about Hermann Cohen. Hermann Cohen was a German philosopher at the end of the 19th century, beginning of 20th century, a student of Kant. Hermann Cohen was reform, a reformed Jew, and he was anti-Zionist in ideology because he said that the Jewish nation is, is a chosen nation and the, na and, the, and the mission of the Jewish nation is to be a spiritual nation, a nation that spreads spirituality and morality and ethics amongst all the nation. Therefore, exile is not a, an, only an accident, a tragedy. Exile is actually a progress. Jews don't need territory. As George Steiner says, what, what is your, what is your uh, dream? To have, a Jew, uh, to have a Jewish policeman? To have a Jewish soldier that kills people? to have a, a Jewish Ganev, uh, to have, a, well, th this is, this is not what we're aiming to. So here there is a, an, an interesting coalition. Uh, uh, th these circles are strongly believing in Jewish nationality in, in terms of the Jewish people who have a nationality around the Torah. As La Abdel Rav Sadia Gaon says, Einu mateinu uma ela betorotea, our nation is defined by the Torah. And we're a spiritual nation, therefore territory doesn't define us as a nation. And uh, all these material aspects are not for us. Army, sovereignty. I wanna share with you another thinker and then I'll, we'll go to the, to the sources. 
As a young man, I read a book in Hebrew. Perhaps it was translated to English. I hope it was, but I'm not sure. There is the famous Israeli writer, Amos Oz. Amos Oz is an extremely famous Israeli writer, passed away not that long ago, uh, was a, a candidate to, to, to get a Nobel Prize many times, a very good writer. Amos Oz has an interesting book uh, that I, I feel even, I, I think it's good that I'll share with you some, uh, a little introduction about the book. It, it brings you to Israeli uh, spirit. Amos Oz in, 19, in, the, in the 80s, he wrote a book called Po Vesham Be'eretz Yisrael, Here and There in Eretz Israel. This book is not a regular book of Amos Oz. It's not a novel. These are, he came like a, as a half journalist. He spent time in Beit Shemesh in a Beit Cafe and heard the people in Beit Shemesh, their anger, their support of Menachem Begin, then their anger on what Mapai, Miflegat Avodah, did to them. And he recorded it and presented it and wrote it in his fashion. Uh, there, is, there are two chapters there about his meeting in Ofra with settlers. Uh, parenthetical remark, Amos Oz is, is, is a merits supporter. He's left-wing in his opinions. So uh, he spent time with Afra settlers. He spent time with this group, with that group. And he wrote his book about his travels in Eretz Israel, Po Visham Be'Eretz Israel. Interesting book. Now, the book starts, and here is my point and the relevance to our class. The book starts, the book of Po Visham Be'eretz Yisrael starts with Amos Oz visiting in Jerusalem where he grew up, in the neighborhood where he grew up. Now guess what? Amos Oz grew up in Geula. Geula, Meshar, that area. Once upon a time, when Amos Oz was a kid, that was a very mixed area. It wasn't only a Haredi area like today, okay? And he himself, his house was traditional, not religious. So, and his teacher, by the way, was the, uh, uh, the poet uh, Zelda. Zelda was his first grade teacher. So Amos Oz write a, writes a book about his travel. I mean, the first, chap, the first chapter is starting with his visit in Geula. And of course, he uh, documents the change of the demography in the neighborhood, that it became Haredi or, or already then in the 80s. And then Amos Oz uh, 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 introduces us to a dialogue. And here I want you to listen carefully because this is, will be something that we'll, we'll focus on this year. Amos Oz is, record, is, is documenting there a, an interesting dialogue, exchange of words that he had with one of the Haredi there. And the Haredi is telling him the following smart uh, uh, statement. He says, you need to understand, I'll say the, the sentence in Hebrew and then I'll translate it. Kol inyan ha-medine ze goyim naches. Okay, he tells him, the whole issue, the whole interest of a Medina, of a state, is goyim naches. It's shtusim of goyim. Maybe we need to do it. By the way, this, 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 uh, this uh, Haredi, he wasn't necessarily in a Turi Karta. It's not that he didn't say that we need a state of Israel. But in terms of value, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. You need a refrigerator in your home, right? All of you. That doesn't give the refrigerator a spiritual value. You, there, there's some tools that one needs. So you need sovereignty, but sovereignty is a secular thing. And now, now it's the fashion of the Goyim in the past 200 years, nation, nationalism, that different nations have sovereignty and independence. It wasn't that all, all time. And therefore, we should be players in this world. The Karadi acknowledges that. But well, you guys are Zionists, and he's speaking to a secular Zionist, to Amos Oz. You guys are Zionists, but hey, relax. This whole issue of Medina is a Goyim Nachas. 
One needs a refrigerator. One needs a sovereignty. That's all. Not more and not less. It's a nachas of goyim. And that's all. Now, what's interesting is that like six, in the middle of the book, many, many chapters later, Amos Oz documents the speech he gave to Ofra settlers in a debate, in a public debate that was there. It was starting with a speech that he gave them as their guest in Motzei Shabbos. Motzei Shabbos, he spent the Shabbos with them in Ofra, and then he gave a speech. And guess what Amos Oz said? Amos said, Oz said, I don't hold like Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion sanctified the sovereignty, the nationalism, the mamlachtiyut. Ben-Gurion sanctified it. Amos Oz told them, I'm not in that school of thought. I hold that Medina is goyim naches. Anyone who had good memory saw where he took that terminology, he just copy-pasted. It was very smart of Amosos. At the first chapter, he put it in the mouth of the Haredi that spoke with him and rebuked him. And then he himself said, you know what? In that sense, I agree with that Haredi. I, Amosos. Both of us, I'm secular, atheist, he's a Haredi, but we have a common denominator that we're not sanctifying the Jewish sovereignty over the lands, the territories of Israel. We see it as a tool. It's something needed. It's a refrigerator, not more than that. All right, so I think I clarified the, 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 what I'm discussing here. And now what I wanna do quickly, I understand that we have time till 12. Am I correct or what, to a quarter to 12? Answer please, to, what, 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 where, where, when it, uh, to when is this shear going? Quarter to 12, what, what? Where's the bat shirut? She should help me out here. She knows the, the, the rules. Quarter to twelve. Quarter to twelve. Thank you. All right. So let's go. Um, I'm sharing with you a screen. And here, annexation of Judea and Samaria, or announcing sovereignty over uh, 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 parts of Judea and Samaria. Is there any value? Is there any value in Jewish sovereignty? Meaning, my my question here is not only regarding Judea and Samaria. Uh, this uh, the, the title is just because now it's current events. Rather, it is regarding the entire thing. So we'll start with Ramban. Ramban's famous statement in the Sefer HaMitzvot, Ramban claims that uh, there is a positive commandment to dwell in the land of Israel. As we know, Maimonides held, and that's controversial, Maimonides didn't count the mitzvah of Yishu Eretz Israel of dwelling in the land of Israel. Maimonides didn't count it. I know, I, I stopped sharing it. I, I'm saying some introductory, and then we'll, we'll go again to the sources, the sources itself. There is, as we know, Maimonides in his code book, Sefer HaMitzvot, not code book, it's in his book of mitzvot, the book that he counted the 613 mitzvot, Maimonides did not count the mitzvah of dwelling in Eretz Yisrael as a, as a positive commandment. Nachmanides makes a glossary on it, and he says, I disagree. You forgot to count this mitzvah. How come you didn't count this mitzvah? Some achronim, like Megillah Sester, hold that really Maimonides holds that nowadays there is no positive commandment to dwell in the land of Israel. However, most commentaries of the Rambam disagree with this and hold that the Rambam, of course, agrees that the mitzvah to dwell in Eretz Israel is valid even nowadays. Only for technical reason, it's not counted as one of the 613, either as Rav Cook claims, because it's a general mitzvah, he sees it as a general mitzvah that you don't count, or other opinions say that it's included in some other mitzvot that he counted. This way or that way, Nachmanides definitely counts it as a mitzvah. But again, Mechora, this, this commandment that the Ramban counts as a positive mitzvah, this commandment has nothing to do with our topic. 
Because the fact that there is a commandment on individuals or even on public people, uh, on a group of people, to live somewhere doesn't, yet, doesn't mean yet that there's any Jewish value in the government, in the Jewish sovereignty. So let's see how Ramban defines the commandment to dwell in the land of Israel. And you'll see there some of the comments that you all wrote in the chat. So I'm sharing the, the, the sheet again. Look, Ramban, I'm reading to you together. It's in Hebrew and I'll translate to English. That we were commanded, we were commanded to inherit the land that God blessed he gave to uh, our uh, patriarchs, to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And we will not leave it by any other of the others of the nations or to be uh, shmama, to be uh, empty. The thing is this, as you could see, this commandment is, is not only that he's telling you, the commandment is to inherit the land. La reshet, le horish. So it's, as people said here, to conquer. Furthermore, the statement is not to leave it by any other nation. So he's clearly talking about nations here. And when he commands the Jewish people, when the Torah, according to Ramban, commands the Jewish people, not to leave it by any other nation. A simple warning, I know it's not an absolute proof, but the simple flow of the wordings of Ramban is that it's talking about sovereignty, not only about simply living there, because it says, don't leave it, inherit it, and don't leave it by any other nation. Who doesn't leave a land by any other nation? A nation. That is us. Let's continue. And what is the pasuk that is the source for this positive commandment of inheriting the land and not letting any other nation to be there? You should inherit the land and dwell there. Because I, Hashem, gave you this land to inherit it. And you should live in that, settle in this, and you should settle the land. And now look at how Ramban continues. And this is what the sages are calling milchemet mitzvah. Clearly he speaks about war. There is a positive commandment to do a mitzvah to inherit the land. Now, who does wars? Individuals does wars? Do wars? No, individuals don't do wars. The ones who do wars are nations. So it's definitely a commandment on, over the nation is commandment, and the nation is commanded to inherit the land, i.e. to make a government there, to rule it. And he continues, and I'm saying that this is the mitzvah that the sages are speaking so much about it, so highly about it. And this is to have a dira, to dwell in Israel, to live there, and they said that anyone who leaves the land of Israel is considered an idol worshiper. So here we switch to the individual. He says, all of this is part of this positive commandment that we were commanded to dwell and settle there, to, to, to inherit and, and sit there. Therefore, he concludes, it's a positive commandment for generation. Every individual is commanded by it, and even at the time of exile. So look at what he's saying. My Nachmanides says the following, when he is arguing with, the, um, with Maimonides, so of course they're arguing about the individual because both Maimonides and Nachmanides lived at the time of exile and without any Jewish sovereignty in Israel. But Nachmanides wanted to say, don't, don't tell me that Maimonides didn't count the mitzvah because Maimonides thought that the commandment is only to the Jewish nation to inherit the land. Don't tell me that, because I think that part of the details of that commandment of inheriting and making a war to conquer it, part of the details of that mitzvah is also a commandment of every individual to have a place in Israel and live there. So the original commandment, according to my Nachmanides of Yishu Beretz Israel 
is actually a national commandment to have a Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. That what seems to be the simple wording. So, Avi Kanai, you said in the beginning of the class, ah, oh, there is a mitzvah of Yishu Betzer Eretz Yisrael, but you can't prove from here that there is a value in Jewish sovereignty. Well, no, at least the simple reading of Nachmanides, I know one can argue a little bit, we'll see later people saying it even more clearly, is that part of the commandment to dwell in Eretz Yisrael, not only part, even the, the, the original commandment, the, 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 the basic commandment, is on the nation as a nation, not to leave the land to any other late nation, but that the nation as a nation will be there. So even if that doesn't correspond necessarily directly to the concept of modern national sovereignty, but it's still some sense of national dwelling and not le letting any other nation as a nation to dwell, well, plus minus that, that means uh, some government and, 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 and uh, Jewish government and sovereignty in the land of Israel. That's the, at least the simple understanding. So first answer is the value uh, of Jewish sovereignty is part, and maybe even the original part of, of, um, of uh, Mitzvah Yishu Veres Yisrael. Now we have a comment of a very smart rabbi, religious Zionist, called Rabbi Yehuda Brandes. See, Rabbi Yehuda Brandes, here I'm marking it. Rabbi Dr. Yehuda Brandes is the dean of, uh, and the head, is, is the head of the Herzog College that is next to, that is right by the Gush Yeshiva. A big Talmud Chacham also has a PhD in Talmud. And he wrote many, many years ago an article in Tchumim. And he wrote something that I think as a fact, as a fact is true. He speaks about the medieval Rishonim, the thinkers, our medieval rabbis, Rambam, Rashba, Rabbi Levi, all these, and he says, when they related to the mitzvah of Yishu Eretz Yisrael, the Rishonim did not attribute significance to the question of sovereignty over the land at all. Meaning it is true that the issue of sovereignty over the land was not an issue that was emphasized and discussed by, and they didn't attribute significance to it. The main discussion was about living in Israel and having a sovereignty over the land of Israel is not something that took an importance in the medieval uh, uh, thinkers. However, later on, we see some explicit comments regarding it. Let's look at what Reb Tzadok HaKohen Milublin, yeah, a Hasidic writer, Reb Tzadok HaKohen Milublin, writes about the mitzvah of Yishu of Eretz Yisrael, with a direct relationship to the issue of sovereignty. He says, dwelling, Yishu Eretz Yisrael, dwelling is defined only as a peaceful dwelling. And what does it mean, peaceful dwelling? That you are the master of the land. When you're commanded to dwell in the land of Israel, the ideal dwelling is that you're dwelling there as a government, peacefully. This is what's called dwelling. And that means when the Beit HaMikdash is built. And when the Beit HaMikdash is destroyed, even, even though not all of them were expelled from the land, there wasn't full exile. So there was a period of time that the Mikdash was destroyed, but still there was dwelling of people, of, of Jewish people in the land of Israel. Even those Jews that were dwelling there are not really called Yoshvei Aretz, dwellers of the land. And they're not really considered dwelling there because they're slaves to the people, they're slaves, they're subordinate, they're under the leadership, they're, they're submissive, they're subordinate to the kings of the, uh, of, the, of the Gentile nations that are governing, that are ruling there, just like us in Chutzlart. This is not called, this is not considered dwelling. This is just being a gear, uh, a, a visitor in the, in the land, and you're not Mekayim Bishatem. What Rabtzadok here explains 
he says, okay, you were commanded to dwell, a shevet, to dwell, to, to reside in the land of Israel, to be a resident in the land of Israel. But if you're not, if there's no Jewish sovereignty, there's no Jewish government there, rather there is a British mandate there, even if this Bridget, British mandate is extremely generous and gives you full religious rights and everything, you're not really dwelling in the land in its full meaning. Because when I'm dwelling in the land, that means that I'm sitting there as a Balabite. As a Balabite. That is really what's considered that you have a full, that you're now Mekayim Mitzvah Yeshu Eretz Yisrael. Full fulfillment, the complete fulfillment of Mitzvah Yeshu Eretz Yisrael, the commandment to be in the Asher Eretz Yisrael, is that you are, not only that you physically now, your feet, your, your foot is on the land of Israel, on the soil, is that you are a Balabite. The, regarding the king, I will we'll come into it later. So please bear with me. I'm now trying to make an argument not about the king, okay? Uh, it, uh, the, 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 the comments about the king are extremely relevant and I relate to them. But now I'm making the case for, 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 Jew, for religious value and Jewish sovereignty, even without addressing the question of the king, okay? Just you're commanded to dwell in the land of Israel. Reb Tzadok says, what is the meaning, the full, the ideal, the Hidur mitzvah meaning of dwelling? That you are a Balabite. That makes sense. Now, let's continue. Pretty much, this, slightly different, but, but pretty much in the same direction. The Yeshua Malko, one of the Achronim in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, 20th century, the Yeshua Malko writes the following. Indeed, also according to Nachmanides that considered the mitzvah of uh, dwelling in the land as a positive commandment, Mikol Makom, he, he agrees with Nachmanides, that's what he says, that the main core, the, 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 the ideal way, the ikar of the mitzvah is really as Ramban, and by the way, he's right. We saw it in Nachmanides. We saw it in his, in his wordings that the, 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 the commandment is really Yerushavi Shiva, inheriting it, conquering it, and dwelling there. And look at, look at his very nice terminology. I said a balabayit. Look at what he says. Ke adam like someone who does in what he himself owns. So therefore, you need to conquer the land of Israel that will be under, under our inheritance. Not like nowadays, he spoke before the foundation of the land of Israel. Not like nowadays that we're coming with empty hands, meaning, and even though, even now, it's a, a, obviously a big mitzvah, and there is no doubt that it's a big mitzvah because the fact that we're gathering in the land of Israel is akhalta de geula, is the beginning of the geula. But still, the, the ikar ha mitzvah, as, as Nachmanides says, and he's basing himself on Nachmanides, he just explains it very similarly to the Reb Tzadok HaKon Melublin. The shiva, dwelling, the, the full meaning, the full meaning of dwelling somewhere is that you are there as an owner, like a person who does in his own thing, in his own stuff. So therefore, the commandment to dwell in the land of Israel already includes in it Jewish sovereignty, according to this approach. Let's see what Rabbi Zevin, the giant, the one who wrote, wrote Moadim Ba'alacha, the editor of the Talmudic Encyclopedia, that uh, was at the time of founding the land of Israel, a tremendous Talmud Chacham. Let's see what Rav, Rav Zevin quoted in Tchumen Yud says. The foundation of the, of the state, the establishment of, of the state of Israel gives special value to the mitzvah of Yishu Veretz Israel, to all the territories that are in the domains that are under the sovereignty over, uh, of the state. Nachmanides, that counts the dwelling in the land of Israel as part of the Taryag, is including it inside the commandment 
to of inheriting and conquering and milchemet mitzvah. So how will I define this inheriting and conquering when I'm in exile? So he says, the Marcheshet says that the mitzvah is applied, is, is fulfilled when you are acquiring the land of Israel, when you are purchasing it. Meaning even before there was the state of Israel, a Jew that not only dwelled in the land of Israel, but actually bought here, bought here territory, that's a kind of already an owner like a person who does that his own thing. Therefore, he says, the climax, the, the top, the, the, the peak, peak of this mitzvah is fulfilled in its full completeness, in its full heater. You can't reach in all the time of the exile till now when we founded the state, both in quality, that now we have full ownership and full releasing of it, and also in terms of quantity, because we have here much more territories that are released. And lead us to say that all these that are assisting to establish the, the state of Israel and to found it are partners in the fulfilling of that mitzvah that is so significant that it stands like all, it, it is parallel to all the mitzvahs of the Torah. I think Rav Zevin, coined it so clearly, as you know, Rav Zevin, you should appreciate the Hebrew, those who know to read Hebrew, who are good with reading Hebrew, Rav Zevin is the master of expressing complex ideas in clarity and simple words. That's his, that's his, that's his uh, skill. So Rav Zevin said it so nicely. The minimum is a Jew that makes Aliyah, even at the time of exile, even at the 1800s, of 1700s, if he was able to do so, maybe he doesn't have money to buy a, 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 a place in Israel, but he comes and just lives here. That's already one step. A higher level of fulfilling the mitzvah of Yishu Veretz Yisrael, and why is that? Because the original mitzvah is to inherit the land and dwelling the, the, the most full, accomplishment of dwelling is that you're a balabayit, as if you're doing in your own thing. Therefore, the next step is if a Jew, even though there's no sovereignty here, there's a British mandate, but a Jew acquires, purchases a place in Israel and lives there as a private balabayit at a certain home. That's already a bigger level of fulfilling dwelling, because he's already somewhat at a qualitative jump in the fulfillment of the mitzvah of Yeshua Yisrael, says Rav Zevin, is when you have a Jewish state. All the territories that are under their Jewish sovereignty, there is now a national ownership over them. It doesn't matter that here and there may be an Arab or, some, or any other Gentile, or I don't know, as a private property in Israel. That's great, but still there is a concept of the state of Israel has ownership as the sovereign, as the government over the entire territories that are under Israeli law. So that is the biggest fulfillment of Yishu Eretz Yisrael, the Horash Temota, inheriting it, not living it to be governed by any other nation, like a person who does that his own thing. So clearly here, Rav Zevin establishes, and that's only an interpretation of Nachmanides. Yeah, it's just a, a natural interpretation of Nachmanides that the fullest dwelling is as one who does that his own thing. And therefore, uh, uh, Jewish sovereignty has a value. If we'll go to our concrete, actual, uh, uh, question, announcing sovereignty over parts of Judea and Samaria. I can't say that there is an obligation to do that. Of course, a, a prime minister has a legitimacy in my humble eyes, halachically, to have all kinds of cheshboinas, pikuach nefesh, all this, but is there a Jewish value to do it? Of course there is, according to this Rav Zevin. The more lands are under Jewish sovereignty, 
the more lands are now released and now it's considered the full, the full accomplishment of the commandment of Yishuv Eretz Yisrael. Let's continue. The Tzitz Eliezer here, the Tzitz Eliezer here, I don't want to read it now for the lack of time. He, uh, oh yeah, yeah, no, no, you know what, we'll read it, I can't resist. The fact that there is an obligation to make Aliyah and to settle the land when the land was established, I want to say my main point here, he says, to prove, according to Allah, that the obligation to make Aliyah and to dwell it didn't become less once the land was established and once we achieved sovereignty. On the contrary, it became even bigger. I want to explain the background to his tshuva. There were some wise guys that claimed to Tzitz Eliezer that after the Jewish state was, was established, there's no more commandment to make aliyah. The Tzitz Eliezer heard from some Jews abroad that, okay, if the Jewish people made, established the Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel, then we fulfilled the commandment in the Torah of inheriting the land as a nation, and the fact that some individuals still choose to live abroad, that's not a problem at all, and they don't even have an obligation to come because the state is already established. So he says, I disagree with this. Not only that the, com that the, com that the uh, uh, commandment to make Aliyah didn't disappear after the founding of the Jewish state, on the contrary, it became even more significant. Why? He says, it is even more valuable. And why is that? Because he says, it's wrong to think that the main commandment was before founding the land in, in order to found it. He says, because we'll prove that the mitzvah of Aliyah is an independent one. And here he summarizes. The mitzvah of Aliyah and dwelling in the land is, is separated to two. There is a general commandment on Am Yisrael to dwell in the land, to be a, a, to be a tzibur here. And there is a private commandment on every individual to come to do Aliyah. Now he says it's even a double commandment after the state was the individual one, because the general commandment uh, is is now when he is doing, when he is now making Aliyah, he's actually fulfilling two, two, two things in one. A, he is fulfilling his private obligation. And also privately, he should be part of the, when he's strengthened, when he dwells in the land, he is strengthened. Every Jew that comes here makes our sovereignty even stronger. The more Jews that are here, the more our national holding in the land is stronger and he also assists in that and therefore definitely he should come now i am skipping for a second a page and let's go to the other direction one direction that we spoke about was uh the val the jewish value the religious value and jewish sovereignty over territories of the land of israel over areas of the land of israel is just to fulfill the commandment of inheriting the land of Yishu Veres Yisrael, dwelling in the land because the, the ideal, the fullest, the most mehudar meaning of dwelling is as an owner. Now we'll go to the other direction that Marsha and others mentioned already in the beginning. And, and the last one who wrote a chat also mentioned it. The Gemara in Sanhedrin says the following. Rabbi Yudah says, there are three commandments that the, pe the Jewish people were commanded when they were upon entering the land. Three commandments, Rabbi Yudha says in the Gemara, were uh, uh, the Jewish people were commanded at, at, when, at the time they were entering the land. One is to establish to them a king, to appoint a king. Second is to destroy a malik. Third is to build the, 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 the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. Rabbi Nehorai 
a Tana. Rabbi Yehuda is a Tana. He says this. Rabbi Nehorai disagrees. This parsha of the king was said only because they were complaining and asking to have a king. As it says, Ve'amarta asima la'imelech. As we know, the terminology in Parsha Choftin, in the paragraph that commands us to appoint the king, is a little, is, is, uh, is ambiguous. Um, can give uh, two, uh, a, a, a double impression. On the one hand, it doesn't say there, you are commanded to appoint a king. It is says, when you will come to the land, when you will come to the land, and you will, when you will come to the land, and you will uh, uh, ask, I want to, I wish to have a king like all the nations around me, then you should appoint upon yourself a king. So on the one hand, it is presented as if it's merely a response to a request of the people of Israel. If you will come, it's a stipulation. It's not an absolute commandment. If you will come and you will be jealous at the other nations that have a king and will say, oh, I want the same fashion, then appoint upon yourself a king. And these are the, the laws of this king. But on the other hand, the language is som tasim. You should appoint yourself, uh, you should appoint upon yourself a king. So that gave room for ambiguity. And Rabbi Yudah said, no, it is a positive commandment. And Rabbi Norai says, no, it's not a positive commandment. It's just an option. It's not a, it's just a hector to appoint a king. That's a machloikis. And this machloikis that is between Tanaim is also between Rishonim. Because Maimonides definitely has an opinion here. Here. Maimonides counts. He commanded, Hashem commanded us to appoint upon ourselves a king. He should gather our nation and will rule us, as it, it says, Son Tasim Alecha Melech. He holds with Rabbi Yudah's opinion. On the same token, Maimonides in Hilchos Melachim, he says, when he describes the days of the Messiah, he says, the reason why, uh, no, you know what? I'll leave this uh, Maimonides because it's my next point. Maimonides holds that there is a positive commandment to appoint a king. Abarbanel, he holds that it's a sin to have a king. Okay? And only, you know, just like Eshet Yafator is not a great thing. It's a goyim naches, but the Torah gave us a heter. The king is also a goyim naches. That's what the Torah, I, 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 by the way, that's how the Torah even coins it. So he says, if you will come to the land and you'll say, I want a king just like all the, the Gentiles around me. Goyim naches. So Abarbanel holds that a king is goyim naches. And the Rambam says, no, it's part of the ideal Jewish state. Now, people here said, justified, they said, you know what? You asked whether there is a value in Jewish sovereignty. I'll tell you, if there is a positive commandment, if we rule like the Rambam, that there is a positive commandment to appoint a king, obviously that means that not only there is a mitzvah to, to just live and breathe air, in the land of Israel, but there's also um, a, a Jewish value in having a Jewish king that is ruling the land of Israel. Value for Jewish sovereignty. Okay, that is, I hear, but here one can still argue. Is there a value from this perspective, I'm, I'm stressing from this perspective, not that, not that, not what I presented in the first half of this year, that the value of Jewish sovereignty is full dwelling in the land of Israel. But if we're attacking the topic, we're approaching the, to approaching the topic from the perspective of the commandment to appoint the king of Maimonides, well, here, many Haredim will claim to you, aha, the Jewish state, this current Jewish state, that has nothing to do 
with the commandment of Maimonides to appoint a king. Maimonides describes this king, his role is to enforce and assist the Jewish people to perform the Torah. We're not talking about that. Furthermore, we're talking about a king. Here it's a democracy. It's not a king. It's not the Jewish king that the Torah is talking about. So this has no relevance to us. So from this perspective, announcing uh, uh, sovereignty over uh, areas in Judea and Samaria by this democratic secular state, from this perspective, it's meaningless. It has nothing to do with the Rambam's commandment to appoint a king or the opinion in, uh, in the sages that the Rambam ruled halacha lemaise, that there is a commandment to appoint a king. Okay, here we must make a comment. This argument was definitely not accepted by many thinkers and rabbis. Some rabbis, and I personally agree with them, hold that the commandment to appoint a king really includes a commandment to have Jewish sovereignty. Let me explain. Meaning a king is the form that is written in the Torah. Okay? That's the common form that was back then. But actually, any other form of Jewish sovereignty is included in that commandment. I want to say more than that. Rav Cook, like, I'll, I'll explain, like, um, the Torah, what is the Torah doing there? The Torah is saying, saying, if you will want a king like you have around you, then I command you to appoint a king, but he will be a holy king, he will have a sofer Torah in front of his eyes, he will be restrained with power, and all this. So, let me translate that same paragraph to our days. If you come to the Jewish state in 1948 and you say, I want to have a democracy like all civilized nations, my time. You should have a democracy, but this democracy will have to be a democracy with the character of this and this and this. And I think that's really what's written in the Torah. But I'll tell you, forget about me. Rav Cook, Rav Cook, and is, is quoted a lot. Rav Cook is claiming in his tshuvas, in his halachic tshuvas, not as a, not in a piece of uh, thinking, a philosophy. Rav Cook claims in one of his halachic responses that the king really gets his power from the nation. The king is appointed by Hashem, but by the nation. The king, and I, I once gave an entire share about it when I gave a share about democracy, the king must have the support of all the tribes, the approval, whatever it is. So really, Rav Kook says when there is no king, the power of the king returned to the entire nation. The entire nation has a power, and the king is representing it. When the king, when there is no king, all, uh, some of these authorities, some of these authorities, some of them, return to the nation as a whole. And therefore, our democracy, our Jewish state, to some meanings have a din, says Rav Kook, of Malchus Yisrael, of the Kingdom of Israel. Meaning, if you ask, why should I pay taxes in Israel? What obligates me to pay taxes in Israel? So some answer, some answer, Dina de Malchuta Dina. Just like in America, and I'm obligated to pay taxes because whatever sovereignty you live in, of the, whatever Malchus you live in, you should uh, do, uh, uh, follow their laws generally. But another answer, will be no, there is a special din here of Malchus Yisrael, because our sovereignty in regarding some aspects have, has a din of Malchus Yisrael, okay? 
So in sum, the answer we're giving now is that there is a religious value in Jewish sovereignty, not only because of our first answer that that's the fullest and complete and ideal and mehudar meaning of dwelling in the land of Israel, but also because there is an independent value of Malchus Yisrael, of having a Malchus Yisrael, okay, a Jewish kingdom or sovereignty in the lands of Israel. Now there can be an argument whether our sovereignty, when it's not religious, whether it still has that value. Here, for that, let's see what the Rambam says. The Rambam says, in Hilchos Malachim, when he describes the days of Messiah, the Rambam says the reason why the Chachamim and the Nevi'im, the, the, the rabbis and the prophets, desired the days of the Messiah, they desired the day of the, of the Messiah, not in order to control the entire world, not in order to control the entire world, and not in order that they will uh, um, control the Goyim, and not in order to be praised by the Goyim, and not only to have uh, material good, but so that they will have time to learn Torah and its wisdom, and there won't be any foreign ruler that will disturb them from doing that in order that they will inherit the Olam Ham. Okay. Maimonides, we, let's go a little bit back. Maimonides claims, as opposed to some, as opposed to some other thinkers, that there's no real big difference in nature, in terms of the form of nature, laws of nature, between the days of the Messiah and our days. He says, the only difference is Jewish sovereignty. That we're not enslaved, Meshuabadim, that we're not subordinated and enslaved by the other nations. This is what he sees the, different, the main difference between the days of the Messiah and the days of uh, uh, and, and, and our days. And that is, in his eyes, according to the Maimonidian vision, that is in order to facilitate uh, by the fact that you are relaxed and you have Jewish sovereignty and independence, then you're free to develop in Torah. Now, what happens about a, a Jewish sovereignty that is not that from Ben-Gurion, Netanyahu, not that from a Jewish sovereignty, a state that is secular, even forget about the individuals that I mentioned, but the state is not run by Torah law. It's a secular democratic state. By the way, not completely, but that's a different story. So now look at what Rav Amital wrote in an article. Rav Amital, and it's good that we're learning him because Rav Amital, in a few weeks, it will be 10 years since he passed away. So my Rebbe, Rav Amital, I'm now learning in his, in his uh, memory, ten, almost 10 years after he passed away, my Rosh Hashiva. Rav Amital writes the following. With all the problems that we have in the state, with all the problems that we, and the challenges that we have in the state, we cannot uh, overlook, ignore the miracles, the big miracles that we were zochah to them when we established it. The Rambam, and look at what he says here, the Rambam knew very well the natures, the nature of the kings of the, of Hashmonai. He writes, you know, Rambam writes, in Perush HaMishnayot, you know that in the days of the Second Temple, things were not totally ideal, as you know, and the kings were not going following the, our Jewish tradition, and they would appoint a king by force even though they're not allowed to do so. So the Rambam is well aware of the fact that the kings of the house of Hashmonai, some of them were not righteous at all. And yet still, the Rambam writes that the establishment of founding the kingdom of Hashmonaim 
is one of the main reasons to celebrating Hanukkah. When Rambam explains why are we celebrating Hanukkah in his code book, he's saying the, 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 the people of the Hashmonai, the big, the, the big Kohanim, they beat the, the, the Greeks and they saved the Jews from them. And then they appointed a king from the Kohanim. The Chazra, here is the important uh, sentence. The Chazra Malchut Israel for more than 200 years. And because of that, the sages in that generation established the eight days. What is, what is Rambam saying here? And that's important, and I heard it many, many times from my Rebbe Ravamita also orally. Hashmonai kings were, um, some of them were, were very, very uh, problematic from a religious perspective. And yet still, it's called Malchus Yisrael. And Rambam says you celebrate Hanukkah for the reestablishment of Malchus Yisrael. In the Tanakh, we see many kings that weren't the Chazonishnikim, to say the least. And yet still, the prophets rebuked them, but they all acknowledged and recognized them as legitimate and valid kings of Israel and as the kingdom of Israel or the kingdom of Judah. So therefore, it definitely is, according to this line of thought, considered Malchus Yisrael. Last point in the shir, and very important. Um, yeah. Uh, there is, I have a friend called, older than me, an alumni of our yeshiva, called Dr. Eli Haddad. Eli Haddad is a doctor for Jewish thought. Teaches in Herzog College and also, I think, a little bit in the Hebrew. I don't know. And he wrote a very, very interesting article. You know what? I'll stop sharing it. If we'll have time, we'll read it inside. He wrote a very, very interesting article in the past Yom Ma'ut, not that long ago, past ER, about, uh, for Yom Ma'ut, about the approaches of Rabbi Yudah Levi on the one side, and Maimonides on the, uh, on the other side regarding uh, Yom Ma'ut. And I'll explain. He said, he, his, his, he, his claim is very interesting, simple and interesting. He says, in, it, mostly in the religious Zionist schools, I'm speaking here in Israel, and I agree with him about the fact. In the, state, in the religious Zionist schools, especially Merkaz Arab, Nachmanides gets, Nachmanides, uh, Nachmanides gets this, uh, Nachmanides is, uh, has a very, very big uh, place, and Rabbi Yudah Halevi. Rabbi Yudah Halevi is one of the uh, inspirations, medieval inspirations for religious Zionism, Rabbi Yudah Halevi. His love to the land of Israel, the fact that at the end he makes Aliyah, at the end of the Kuzari book, and says that a full life of a Jew is to live in Israel. Maimonides, on the other hand, takes a much minor, in, in that aspect, of inspiration for religious Zionist ideology. And Dr. Haddad says it's partially a mistake. Because Rabbi Yudah Levi, there is zero, almost zero, and maybe even absolutely zero, but at least, if I want to be careful, almost zero, in the whole book of the Kuzari, he doesn't address the issue of Jewish sovereignty at all. He speaks about the fact that the land of Israel is the land of prophecy, is the land where there is the full meaning of making the covenant with Hashem and keeping the mitzvot, is where a Jew really should live. He speaks about the mystical value, okay, the religious mystical value of Israel for the Jewish individual and the Jewish people. But there is no, the value is just being in that land. You could be a prophet if you're there. You, you really make the fullest meaning, your tefillot, your, 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 the fullest meaning of your religious practices are there. That's Rabbi Yudah Levi. The stress is on Eretz Yisrael. 
However, Maimonides, Maimonides is the thinker that established the value of sovereignty, that explains why sovereignty is so critical and important. And why is that? That is because that has to do with the Maimonidean philosophy. Maimonides thinks that we are social creatures. And in order, in order to uh, shape us, and in order to, to decrease our inclinations and tithes and all this, and to shape us in the right way that we'll have the complete midot so that we will be able to cling to Hashem and have the complete learning of Torah and its wisdom. For that, we need civilization, i.e. a state that is actually conducting the laws of morality and Torah, etc. This is the picture the Rambam saw. Therefore, it was very important for him to have Jewish sovereignty in general, and since our land is Israel, so Jewish sovereignty in Israel. Okay? Now, and as we have seen, he saw it part of the messianic uh, 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 thing, that we will be independent, and by that we'll be less disturbed and free to deal with Torah and its wisdom. Furthermore, according to the Rambam, the Rambam is not a breast lover. The Rambam is not a breast lover in that sense. In other senses, yes. But the Rambam says, according to the Rambam, an individual can really cling to Hashem only when he is in the social, it, 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 part of the social makeup. There's nothing like, you know, full individual clinging to Hashem. The fullest way to cling to Hashem is that when you are shaped by, when you are in a civilization that is shaping you, and then by being part of that public, each individual reaches Hashem. I want to show some quotes and then I'll, I, I, we, we will end. Yeah, I have what, still a minute, so let's see it. Uh, Eli Haddad says the following. Um, Maimonides made a condition, a precondition, regarding the commandment to build the temple. He says, first, you need to appoint a king. What does that mean? That when he says, first, before you build up the, you can't build the temple before you appoint a king, which is a secular function, it means it means that without a sovereignty, without a strong political sovereignty, there is no really way to really know Hashem. And now Eli Haddad says, it's very hard to know what will the Rambam say regarding the renewal of the independence of the land of Israel. We released the government of the barbarians over us, and we're no more subordinated and enslaved to foreign kings. However, the laws of the state of Israel are not the laws of the Torah, and its government is not coercing all the people of Israel to follow the ways of Torah. So he says, it's an interesting question. On the one hand, some of the goals, some of the reasons why the Rambam said that there is so, it's so important that it will be Jewish sovereignty, some of these things were accomplished. We don't have goyim that disturb us. We have the freedom. And we also, and the barbarians, uh, the corrupt, uh, you know, people, uh, we're a civilized uh, society. But on the other hand, it's not the laws of the Torah. So he says, we will find the answer. And here you see that Eli Haddad is a student of Rav Amital. We will find a, a certain answer to that in the Rambam's approach to attitude towards the kingdom of Hashmonai. The Rambam decided to establish the laws, to write the laws of Hallel, all Hallel, and all, only uh, uh, in, in Hilchos Hanukkah. Hanukkahs are the days of the independence of the Malchus of Beit HaShmonai. And these, these 200 years that the Rambam talks about of independence include also things that were definitely not doing the right in the eyes of Hashem. And now, relevance to our days. Eli Haddad says, the state of Israel is counted, is part of the nations that are civilized and, 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 and enlightened, and its cultural 
achievements, it's scientific achievements, it's technological achievements are praised by all. Startup nation. We saw some expression to that in the way, he writes in ER, how we coped with the corona. Uh, and, and here you see how much the fact that you're, a, that you're a citizen in a specific state, in this state or that, they made a big difference regarding your individual welfare. There is no doubt that there is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, benefit a lot of substantial significance and a lot of benefit to a person and to a Jew when he's a citizen of the Jewish state in Israel. Therefore, clearly we should make halal with bracha. If the Rambam said regarding Kashmonai, kal v'chomer now. So to sum it up, uh, we saw two anchors from where to say that there is value in Jewish sovereignty over lands of Israel. One, that's the fullest meaning, the ideal, the mehudar meaning of mitzvah yishuv Eretz Yisrael. Second, there is a value in Jewish sovereignty, and of course it should be in the land of Israel because that's our land, but there is a value in Jewish sovereignty. This enables to, as we said, first of all, that we won't have a, a Gentiles that are disturbing us from uh, uh, doing our practices, and this is the only ideal way in Bezrat Hashem, our state will progress and be more ethical and, and more. Uh, it, that's the only way the media, according to the Rambam, when you cling and reach Hashem. And I'll say even more than that, that in some schools, uh, and here I don't have, the, the, in some Midrashim, the, the, the Malchuta de la Tata, the, 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 the Malchus, Malchus Israel that is under, where like the, Ligion, how will we say the Ligion? Like the army of Hashem, meaning where it continues the, the representatives of, of Hashem here in the, in the land, meaning the Jewish state, like Rav Kook, as I told you in previous shiur, Rav Kook says, Avram Avinu found, founded the Jewish people in order to represent that there could be a nation that is walking as a nation in the ways of Hashem, in the ethical ways. And this you do with all with all the Goyim Nachis, meaning you are expressing that you are a normal, natural nation, okay? That is worshiping Hashem as a nation. And that gives, again, a value to Jewish sovereignty in the Jewish land. Okay, okay. still four minutes. We should call. Okay, Chavarim. Great being with you. Have a wonderful Shabbat. And it was uh, very nice to see the, the, the faces that I know and to see the names that I know. <laughs>